Hello, good evening, welcome. This is Hot Edition. We're live. Money is up here at Desawe Kanda. We're also live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and Beyond, and also on W93.5 in Wa and Beyond. You can also listen to us all across the world on 3news.com. We're live streaming on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at 3FM927. You can log on and share your thoughts on the issue we're going to be talking about this evening. Coming up, Office of the Special Prosecutor reseizes monies from Cecilia Dapa's residence and refreezes her bank accounts after returning and defreezing the said accounts in compliance with the court order. Very interesting developments this evening. We have details of this latest from the Cecilia Dapa OSP matters arising in a statement that just came through from the special prosecutor's office minutes ago. Stay with us. We would get into that shortly. Plus some reactions coming up on this latest development with respect to Cecilia Dapa. The monies that were seized from her residence, a Blinkby residence, by the special prosecutor, which the court ordered the OSP to return and defreeze the accounts that is sought to freeze. We have the latest on that. Stay with us. Also, the Colleges of Education Teacher Association of Ghana, the CTAG, to advise itself if government fails to comply with all outstanding compulsory arbitral awards by October 30, after calling off the one-month-long strike. And this evening, further, Public Accounts Committee considering inviting Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, GTEC, and universities to address a delay in accrediting new programs and renewing existing ones. We have the latest in business, sports, and entertainment and coming up for the next 60 minutes. Here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7, I am Alfred Oconsi. Let's get into the details now. The Office of Special Prosecutor has for the second time seized monies belonging to the former Minister for Sanitation, Cecilia Abnadapa, after her accounts were defrozen after the court order. Now, this was after the OSP had, according to the orders given by the court, gone ahead to unfreeze the bank accounts and return the seized cash in compliance with that court order sometime last week. Remember, a little over $570,000 and over 2 million Ghana cities were said to have been found at the city of the past, Belling Pay Residence, plus some monies in her bank accounts. We're going to be getting details of that shortly because I recall an Accra High Court last Friday ordered the OSP to unfreeze and also return of money seized uh, in compliance with that particular embattled former governor appointee but the office shortly after obeying the court order has gone ahead to freeze the accounts again and seize the set monies that it was ordered to give back to Sicily Adapa. We have details of this very interesting development and my colleague Dennis Poberi with them has been looking into the details of the statement just coming through from the OSP. Dennis what more do we know about this? Alfred, dramatic turn of events, if you ask me, with the OSP coming after Cecilia Abinadapa again. I'm not sure this was a move that was expected. At so all. you recall last week, Thursday, that was the 31st day of August, the High Court had ruled that the OSP, who was in court to seek a freezing order mm -hmm. or to confirm a freezing order and a, a, a seizure order on uh, some properties of Madame Abna Cecilia Dapa. Um, we all know we are too familiar with that story. Mm. The court in that particular ruling had indicated that the OSP did not meet the legal requirement to do what he was doing, i.e. to freeze their accounts of um, Cecilia Dapa and also to seize those assets, including money. So mm -hmm. what the OSP was ordered to do was to return the monies back to Cecilia Dapa and also to unfreeze those seven accounts that we do know some of them are with the uh, Associated General and others are with the Prudential Bank. That's right. So what we are learning today, just a few minutes ago, a statement coming from the OSP indicates that the OSP has complied with the orders of the court. That is, the money has been returned to Cecilia Dapa and that the accounts has been frozen and that this was done in her presence together with her lawyers and with their consent. Hmm. And this is just one part of, 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 of it. Yes. So they were supposed to do that in seven days. So from... Uh, from um, 
last week thursday to now that's even less than, less seven, than seven days. days but they say they've complied with that particular order by returning the money and unfreezing the accounts mm. however they indicate that by that singular act it means that it has terminated the proceedings that the osp brought against madame cecilia dapa in respect of trying to get confirmation orders for the freezing and the seizure of the money mm. however their investigation um, into corruption and corruption related um, offenses against madame cecilia Benadapa are still ongoing and for that matter they still think that they have reasonable grounds to suspect that those monies that have been returned to air are tainted monies and that they are triggering the the powers that they have under the osp act specifically under act uh, section 38 2. So what does Section 38 to um, state in this Act 959 that the OSP is now relying on to go ahead and it refreeze is, the, the, so this set account? It is, it is the same Section 38 that allowed the OSP to go to court to seek a freezing order or to confirm a freezing order that he had put on the bank accounts. So what hmm. the OSP is essentially saying is that even though I have returned the money back to her, I still think that this money is tainted. For that reason, I still have the power to freeze the money in those accounts. It doesn't end there. He still says that the money, the physical money that was taken from the house of Cecilia Dapa as part of investigation, which was seized mm -hmm. and returned to her, the OSP again is coming under um, Section 32 also to, conf to, 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 to seize the money again so that he has instructed authorized officers to go to the... To, to seize the cash mm -hmm. for further investigation. So we're back to where essentially that we are. So as we speak now, the effect of what has happened is that the money has been seized again, the bank accounts have been frozen again, and we may have to go through the same process of having the OSP go back to court to seek a confirmation order to continue with the seizure and also to continue with the freezing of the account. So, so the, the money you're talking about in this case is that two million over two million CDs and the over five hundred seventy thousand dollars that that were found in the billing office. Precisely, the money that was that was retrieved from the home upon the search of the OSP. I see. That was the money in contention. Okay, stay with me, Dennis. Let me acknowledge the presence of uh, Martin Pebble, his private legal practitioner. He has been following this case quite closely and, and with some exclusive information as well on the, from time to time. Lawyer Martin Pebble, thank you so much for joining us here on Hot Edition. Now, uh, I recall that when the, the court ruled last week, you had indicated that the OSP had committed elementary errors. And this was one of the recommendations you made, is it not? I think it's good that the OSC has uh, restarted. So this one, what we have to say is, Ose Kisi, Ose Kisi, Ose Kisi. Ah, because Charles, this thing, we couldn't have allowed Madame Dapa to, you know, keep this money and then, I mean, it would have made uh, this uh, an art of the law. You see, it would have been a big mockery. So it's extremely good that uh, Mr. Kishi Javin has done the right thing by starting afresh. Yes. So hopefully now those timelines things will not uh, start him again. So it's the right thing to do. I see. Now, you, I recall that in the first instance, um, the elementary error that you said the, uh, the OSP had committed, which is unpardonable, was that he failed to disclose the details of the bank account that he wanted the judge to freeze reason why the judge did not even grant that order now in this latest one that the osp is starting all over again he still has that option or that opportunity now to to correct that error is that the case yes absolutely yes so this is fresh it's a new one so there are 14 days we start counting uh, today inclusive, you see, it's within 14 days. So, uh, within the 14 days, we'll hear and by all means, we'll see the new process that will be filed in court. But, uh, yes, yeah, so that's going to be it. Because, you know, uh, the time has started ticking. That's 14 days for the freezing of the account. That is very clear. 14 days for the freezing of the account. And then, seven days for the currency that has been received. So section 32 says come within seven days for the seizure of the account and then the 39 to apply for the reason of the bank account so 
Maybe it's after that count, uh, I have started speaking like that. So this is not the end of it. We'll soon see the application. So it means that even this time, you are going to get two separate, two separate applications. Because, you know, because the currency is uh, seven days, it means that you always to file that one first. And then, subsequently, the uh, freezing of accounts 14 days, it's likely that one will come second. But nothing uh, prevents him from filing all within uh, the time. But hopefully, this side will be two separate applications. Yeah. See, I, I, I've had some lawyers also make the point that uh, this this is contempt, uh, that th this latest move by the OSP. Is there any element whatsoever of this latest action by the OSP getting into the realms of, of contempt of court? No, Mr. Kansi, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of at all. The court said return the money yeah, they seize currency and then unfreeze or defreeze the bank account. And that's what's been done. So you remember on Saturday during the key point, we mentioned this. So, so yes, they will call Madame Dapa and say, Madame Dapa, come for your money. Then Madame Dapa will be like, Nagod, oh, Nagod, Nagod, Nagod. Then when Madame Dapa gets to the gate of the OSC, so that he's, he's gone into the building, collected her money, then she's walking out. So she gets to the gate, and then the security man says, oh, madam, please wait, there's something more. And then the next thing she knows, they are receiving the currency. That's what it will be. Uh -huh. So it's okay. That's the law. So you see why I kept making the point that so for judicial committee and for those reasons, maybe the judge shouldn't have um, made the order that the money be returned. Because now you see it's been returned and it's been received. But well, we have different philosophies in the law. Uh, maybe the justice uh, team wanted it this way. So, mm. well, that, that, that's. Okay, so I have a question, lawyer, from one of our viewers on Facebook. Uh, goes by the name Batong Matthew. He says, "Please ask lawyer Martin Pebble whether the OSP has to research the Cicely of the Paz residence, or he can simply proceed with all previous findings." He will proceed with all previous findings, and I search to if he has cause to believe that there is more. Man. Yes. He can search again. So it's all about information. If his uh, information is that there's more money, yes, he can go in as many times. But it, uh, yes, so that's it. See. The search is not limited. The law has not put a cap on the number of searches you can do. It's all about the intelligence you get. Uh, and finally, before I let you go, apart from these other elementary errors that you, you raised in the the first instance, are there any other actions that the OSP should have taken to have avoided the other reasons why the court adduced for not granting his first freezing order, which should not be repeated in this second instance that he's going at Tisley at the bank accounts again? No, please say that again. I was asking about the apart from the elementary error that you indicated, as in he not disclosing the details of the said accounts that he wanted the judge to give him the OSP um, the order to freeze. Yes. Are there any mm -hmm. other errors or omissions that he should have taken into consideration, which he did not, and going at it this second time, he should also be mindful of. Okay. Um, so the other one would be, be if you look at it in certain respect, Madame Bata's um, statement, the statement that we're taking from her. You know, so far, yes, she hasn't put up any strong defense. But the OSC may see to exhibit the statement that has been taken from her, which will show the loophole in her case. Remember that in this. Uh, part of this case, she has to justify how she came into those funds. Yes, she must justify how she came into those funds. So her uh, statements will be showing how she's not able to justify. So it will make the case very strong. Even though that one is not a match, but 
Now you see that since Madame Dapa is fighting back very hard, I may help to put it in. And you put in the perfect statement. Yes. Lawyer, well, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input on this. Martin Pebble is a private legal practitioner. He's a leader of one of three individual bondholder groups and also uh, the convener of the Kumi Perkorilo, the demonstration, what his thoughts on this. So it's, it's pretty clear um, what the OSP has to be minded of this time around, the second time he is seeking a freezing order from the courts for this uh, Cecilia de Paz, uh, is it seven bank accounts in, in question? Yes, right? yes. Seven bank accounts that he, he, um, he is going to court to have the court give him the order to freeze. Yeah. Plus the money is in there. But I'm asking people has outlined a number of things and, and then also the fundamental, he, he called it an elementary error that the OSP committed in the first instance. But what does section 32 say because um he made reference to that yeah. in, in the statement yes what does it entail so section 32 basically talks about the search and seizure of tainted property um and i read section 32 1 an authorized officer may seize property if that authorized officer has reasonable grounds to suspect that the property is tainted and a it is necessary to exercise the power of seizure to prevent the concealment loss and destruction of the property take note of mm. that Mm. B, the circumstances are so urgent that immediate exercise of the power without the authority of a warrant or order of a court is required. And two, the special prosecutor shall apply to the court on notice within seven days to confirm the seizure. So what it essentially means is that now that the seizure has taken effect, it means that within seven days, the OSP would have to apply to have this um, order confirmed. Mind you, he, had, he, 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 he may have taken cue from what happened in the previous case where the court, as part of other things, mentioned that the applications were made out of time. Mm. Because in respect of the application for the confirmation of the seizure, it had to be done within seven days, like I read. With the freezing order, it has to be done within 14, 14 days. days. But then it turned out that um, both, both applications were made within 14 days. And it's part of the reasons that um, the court gave to dismiss that particular application. Um, subsection 3 says that where the special prosecutor fails to prefer charges within 60 days after the seizure, the special prosecutor shall release the seized property to the person from whom it was seized. Right. Four says that where the authorized officer returns the seized property to the person from whom the property was seized, the authorized officer is immune from prosecution if that authorized officer acted in good faith and seized the property on reasonable grounds that the property was tainted. Hmm. It go goes on to say that, and that's the last subsection, five, where the special prosecutor prefers charges, the special prosecutor shall on notice apply to court to make an order for the continued seizure and retention of the property for a period of two years subject to renewal until the final determination of the matter so basically this is what section 32 of the osp act says when it comes to the powers of the osp to seize property which is suspected to be tainted the other section which is um, important to this particular discussion mm -hmm. is the section 38 right. which allows the osp to freeze and that there's a freezing order or freezing of properties so 38.1 says that where the special prosecutor considers that freezing of a property is necessary to facilitate an investigation or prosecution, mm -hmm. the special prosecutor shall in writing direct the freezing of A, the property of a person or entity being investigated, or B, specified property held by a person or entity other than the person or entity being investigated or prosecuted. Two says that the special prosecutor shall, within 14 days, after the freezing of the property, apply to the court for a confirmation of the freezing. So the distinction has to be made. When it comes to the freezing, it's within 14, 14 days. days. When it comes to seizing the property, it's within seven, seven days. days. And when you continue to read this, it states the grounds under which the OSP can do all that he wants to do. Those were the grounds on which the OSP purportedly um, went to court to make his argument. Unfortunately, that argument did not hold. He may have learned a lot of things from what the court told him, including the fact that he ought to have disclosed a lot more detail than he did with respect mm. to freezing the account. account. And he needed to um, be able to justify or give reasonable basis for which he wanted to freeze or to continue to, um, to seize the money. So the expectation is that moving on, he may have learned from all those things to be able to get this done.
great stuff. Super detail there. Thank you so much, Dennis Barberi. Well done. And you, you can go back to, to 3FM 92.7 on Facebook and um, replay this uh, extensive analysis and explanation from both lawyer Martin Pebo and my, my colleague Dennis Barberi. Well done. Getting into the details of what the law, the provision of the law is. If you go on our Facebook page, 3FM 927 right now, we are, we, you can um, also see the OSP statement. The special prosecutor statement is on our Facebook page at 3FM927 right now. Um, so if you go on our Facebook page at 3FM927, the OSP's latest statement on this Cecilia Adapa case um, is displayed on our Facebook page right now at 3FM927. Also um, on Twitter at 3FM927, you can go there and get to see that statement displayed live. Now, I acknowledge the many, many messages um, that are coming through on this. Uh, but let's go on to the telephone now. And Adam Senano is the co-chair of the Citizens Movement Against Corruption. He's connecting with us. Adam Senano, thank you for your time here on Hot Edition. Very interesting development, is it not? In this case of the... Um, the Cecilia Dapa, now we're hearing from the OSP, is going back at the bank accounts again to have them frozen, plus also the freezing order for the monies that were retrieved um, at her Abelengpe residence. Not entirely surprising. I mean, when the OSP made his last statement, he said they were going to take all actions, legal and otherwise, to ensure that the funds are not dissipated. Uh, for those of us who understand his administrative powers, we concluded that the likelihood was he was going to refreeze. So um, I'm sure for for some of our stakeholders, we expected that this would happen, and we are not too surprised. See, but then you also look at uh, the um, mounting defense that Tuzli uh, Adapai is, is, is putting up for this particular issue, and then also the fact that, according to the lies of lawyer Martin Bebo, the OSP made some elementary errors, uh, which also gives Tuzli Adapa the, the strength to, to go ahead with this particular one. How do you expect the coming days to look like, especially because of how things are playing out um, in this case? Well, I don't know what exactly Martin has said. Uh, the only potential error I can figure would be the timing of the request to the court. Uh, the OSP tried to explain that off as the search and recover period. Um, whatever the case is, the OSP has the power it has exercised to freeze and can potentially continue to do that uh, if they think that they are still in the phase of collecting more data. So it's interesting time. Um, I would rather on any day have a strong institution with a strong man uh, making sure that we are trying to gather as much information as possible on an outstanding case so that they are in a position uh, to draw a conclusion on whether the sources of this money are legitimate or not. If they need more time and they have to freeze and keep the freezing, so be it. But for the public who are watching, I mean, after last week, the sentiment was that this is all staged. Um, it's just a drama that, that we're all caught in and nothing would, would really come out of it. For you, as, as a representative of the mindset and sentiments of the citizens' movement against corruption, what do you, do you expect, um, especially from the OSP as well, so that there will be some confidence that really all of this is not staged? The skepticism of Ghanaians, uh, I think, has been kicking over a period. People just say, you know, um, all of this not to come out of it. I don't think that the idea for us as stakeholders or media is to just go with the narrative. Uh, I think that if you examine the facts, you recognize that there are certain constraints within the limits of the laws we have at the moment. Uh, we're only fortunate to have some aspects of Act 959 that allow the OSP to take this up. Uh, and I think that if they were working with the with Yoko uh, economic crimes, they may find some other aspects there also. Um, 
I don't think that anyone who is looking at this from a technical perspective of the law and what our stakeholders can do, I uh, should jump to the conclusion that this is all drama. Uh, I don't think that the operatives at the OSP would see this as drama. A lot of work is being put into this. Um, let's give them the support they deserve. Uh, yes, the courts too will apply the law and the rules as they see fit. At the end of the day, we pray that Ghana will be the better. At least it is better that through the process, different institutions are learning what they need to do better. And hopefully at the end of the day, it will make more public officers cautious about the kind of actions they take and the sources of the incomes and their declarations of assets, etc. Adam Sanano, I thank you so much for your thoughts. Appreciate you, as always. And thank you, Alfred. Adam Sanano is the co-chair of the Citizens' Movement Against Corruption. We're live here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. We're live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and Beyond, also on W93.5. Beyond, if you just joined us, former sanitation minister Cecilia Bernadapa is not getting the money the office of special prosecutor seized from her house anytime soon. This is because the OSP has invoked its powers to still take custody of the money days after the high court asked the office to return the same money to Cecilia Dapa. The Accra High Court, if you recall, last week ordered the OSP to return the money in question and unfreeze Ms. Dapa's bank accounts. Although the OSP in a statement said, it had complied with the order of the court. It said investigations were still ongoing and believes the money is in question is tainted. Hence the decision to take custody of the amount. The OSP has also frozen Cecilia Dapa's accounts again. So that's the development coming through now. And you've had lawyer Martin Pebo. Dennis Popperi with Dam and Adam Sanano. Thank you. The messages coming through from uh, Ophelia and Sam Baton Matui. So it says that Gov Ghana will be gone if the next government does anything close to what the government is doing. And then this one also here from Mahid Darifu is saying, watching from Yendi as well. Thank you. Salifu Karim, it says that this is not serious. He said the OSB is not serious enough. Please um, ensure that this does end where we all expect so that our suspicions would also be addressed accordingly. Rahel Sumwa, thank you for the message. Um, says, no evidence, Ghana is getting better in the coming days. And Paula Chu, thank you for the message as well. And uh, Ernesto Akala. And also to you, uh, Yao Ametri says, for me, what OSP is doing to in this case, it's irrelevant because under this government, they have borrowed plenty loans to claim developmental projects of Ghanaians, but we need more clarity on the way forward. It says, Lord, Derek Ansa sending us a message, Lawyer Martin, people said this, that this is the way it will go. So those confused should relax. The law is at play, you say. Thank you, David Doji, Nanewodo. Thank you for the message as well. And... Uh, David Lamte says that Ghana is just playing out in a very, very interesting way. Akoli Abraham, you sent us a message as well. Uh, you said this is Anansi and Intikuma storyline. And also Samuel Kujo also sending us a message. And Isahaku Amidu Ali all watching us on Facebook. Thank you. The many, many messages have come through. Unfortunately, we cannot read all of them, but we'll keep track as and when they come through. Um, the Colleges of Education Teachers Union of Ghana, the CTAG, has given government up to the October 30, 2023, to comply with all outstanding compulsory arbitral awards or incur their wrath of the members. CTAG said it will advise itself if the employer fails to honor its obligations under the memorandum of understanding agreed with the association. This was contained in a statement calling off its month-long strike in compliance with directive by the National Labor Commission.
to end the industrial action. The strike brought academic activities across the 46 public colleges of education to a halt. Government in response withheld the August salaries of CTAG members. For now, it's unclear if government will pay the salaries after calling off the strike. And let's go on to the telephone now. Thomas Ampoma is the National Secretary of the Colleges of Education, Teachers Association of Ghana, the CTAG. Ms. Ampoma, thank you so much for joining us here on Hot Edition. Any updates on whether your August salaries will be paid or not? Thank you very much. Thank you to your listeners. So far, there has not been any update as to whether the August salary will be paid. But uh, the National Labor Commission on the 30th of August says the August salary will intervene in the payment of the suspended August salary. So we are hopeful that as we have complied with the directive of the Commission, through the, the votes of our members in the uh, 46 colleges of education, the NLC2 will take steps to ensure that the suspended salaries are paid. Is it one of the conditions that you, you have or you stated and the reasons why you called off the strike that your August salaries have to be paid? No, that's not one of the reasons. Um, our reason stands still that the outstanding composite arbitral awards given on the 2nd of May 2023 to be complied with. That's what we are talking about. The suspended salary is not part of the arbitral awards. It is uh, as a result of the strike that the ministry took that decision. While the National Labor Commission had failed to enforce its own arbitral awards. So at a, at a, at a meeting with the NLC, CITAC said that once we take steps and our members agree to suspend the strike, it, it is on the onus lies on the National Labor Commission to intervene and ask the government to do the right thing. So if government fails um, to also do the right thing, as you're saying, then what next? So on, on the salary issue, I think the next step to be taken by the, by the association, if NLC's intervention fails, we take the necessary legal steps. But on, on the specific issue, reason why you called off this strike, hoping that government would ensure that the right thing is done, if that is not done by October 30, as you have indicated in your statement, then what next? Yes, you know, on the 30th, NLC gave government timelines for complying with all the awards. So the timelines end on the 30th of October, 2023. And by the way, government had already flouted one of the directives given on the 30th of August. The commission asked government to come out with the staff audit report by the 1st of September. Up to now, government has not released the staff audit report. So we are still employing the Labor Commission to compel government to release the staff audit report and the implement theme. So then after October 30, if there's no action taking, then what will be yeah. your next step? So you see our statement is that uh, by 30th of October 2020, 2023, if government had not uh, complied fully with the arbitral awards, it will advise itself accordingly. It means that we have several ways of uh, addressing that issue. Um, and our lawyers are dealing with it. Our lawyers are studying it. So we take the necessary steps when it comes to that time. When are your members returning to the classroom or the lecture hall after this strike you suspended today? Yes, we directed members to report to work later by Thursday, 7th of September, 2023. All members to report to work from 7th September, 2023 and resume work. Zampoma, thank you for time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, my brother.
Ramazan Pama is the National Secretary of the Colleges of Education Teachers Association of Ghana, that's CETAC. The Public Accounts Committee of Parliament is considering inviting Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, GTEC, and the universities to address the delay in accrediting new programs or renewing existing ones. In the view of the chairman of the committee, James Klucha Veji, the prolonged accreditation process for university programs adversely affects students who require their certificates for further education or employment. The committee was discussing the Auditor General's report on the public accounts of technical universities and cycle cycle institutions for 2021 in Sunyang during the second zone public hearing. The issue came to the fore when representatives from Kumasi Technical University appeared before the committee to address infractions cited against the university in the General's report. About 16 programs at the university are at various stages of accreditation. I want to hear from the Public Accounts Committee on this particular issue. Johnson Asiedum Ketia noted that the part... I can say that the delay in granting these the courses partly come from the universities themselves. If you know that the process takes two years, you don't wait until... The accreditation for that course has expired before you start the process. Then we also say that if the course has already been accredited and there's the need for accreditation, why should it take two years? So there must be an issue with the body that do the accreditation as well. There must be some delay from their end also. There is a need for us to bring the two bodies together so that we we'll look at where the problem is and how we can iron it so that we don't examine students on programs and courses that do not have accreditation. You know, we used to have about five to six years arrears, but this committee is determined want to clear all the arrears. So now the only report which is in arrears now is 2022, which we are starting early next year, by January or February. So we hope that by the end of next year, we will not have any report in arrears again. As Jim Kluge, our expectation is that there. Now, let's get into some stories as uh, the Ganaba Association has attributed the recent coup d'etat to increasing corruption among African leaders. Speaking at the opening of a moot court competition and Kumasi president of the association, Yawe Champ Mbwafo, condemned the truncation of constitutional rule while asking leadership to tackle corruption. The sad commentary that after almost five decades of independence, Africa is still bedeviled with rampant corruption, plundering, embezzlement, and mismanagement of the public purse. This unending cycle of corruption has given military adventurists the impetus to truncate constitutional democratic rule without attendant impunity and flagrant abuse of human rights. While we call on governments to continue to implement policies, including novel ones and best practices from around the globe to deal with and contain corruption, in the interim, civil society organizations and professional associations must intensify their advocacy and resort to the use of constitutional and statutory powers to help deal with corruption. Uh, the bipartisan committee uh, probing the IGP leaked audio tape has requested for documents relating to a legal action taken by 82 police officers against the Inspector General Police and the Police Service. The committee chair, Samuel Atacha, is of the view that the writ may help the committee in aspects of his work. But why is this writ important to the work of the committee? There's more in the following report. Trust us as a committee that there is nothing of consequence that will brush it aside. It's going to be a very comprehensive interrogation. So if people want to aid us to do our fact-finding, we will not block them. We've also just seen that some uh, police officers have even taken the IGP to court in relation to their promotion. So I've, I've instructed that they should first the, the, the writ, that we know the content of what is pending in court and the rest of it. The third case of Inspector Osal and 81 others and the Attorney General, the police and the IGP is essentially about 82 serving officers who after acquiring further education on steady leave with pay are demanding promotion. 
this they argue is in line with the procedures of the police service they lament the undue delay in their promotion issues of promotion in the service has emerged strongly during the ongoing hearings here is one of the witnesses superintendent george asari was it from my seven you now proceeded to the headquarters that's correct on our chair so with the protocol outfit at the headquarters is that correct that's correct on our chair do you have problems with that? Honorable, no, far from that. I don't have problem. I don't have authority over transfers. So you're happy as a protocol officer within the police service? Uh, happy as in, in terms of what? My job. And I would say, that's correct, I'm happy. I'm working. Some people don't have a job, and I'm working. They've sent me to a place. Why not? I'm happy. The committee's terms of reference permits it to take on extra issues that may ultimately enhance their work. For the chairman of the committee, this may be the opportunity to resolve the issues around police promotions once and for all. That's a news desk report there to some of the stories. Uh, this time in the central region, a 29-year-old disc jockey with mankasim based coastal fm kwame ejama who is also a taxi driver has been found dead in a police cell in mankasim in the central region ejama was arrested by the jedu police after he refused to stop for a routine check by the police patrol team he was taken into police custody but was found dead in the cell the following day the death of Ejama has sparked outrage in the community with many people calling for justice. The police have been urged to conduct a thorough investigation and to bring the perpetrators to justice. The family of the deceased has expressed shock at the incident and has called for a thorough investigation. We'll bring you more on this particular story as it unfolds and uh, the matters arising here as well on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7 and also live on Kesme 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. Let's stay in the issues of illegal mining as government struggles to end the war against illegal mining. The Paramount Chief of Mampong has taxed his colleagues not to allow mining in the areas. Dasebre Osebonso II cautioned, even with authorization from Minos Commission, he won't allow the mining of gold within his jurisdiction, considering its associated negative impact on the environment. There is more in the following report. The wanting destruction of water bodies and the environment as a result of Galamse is far from over. Government has initiated several interventions to end the menace, but it continues with impunity. Speaking at the opening of the 32nd Christ of Haines African Human Rights Moot Court competition at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Dasibri Osebonsu indicated that chiefs can play a role in overcoming the canker. Some of us paramounties have been bold and we've stuck our neck and chest out to challenge government established commissions, mineral commission, etc., etc. Far from sounding bushful, I kick them out of my kingdom that you can't come to Mount Paul to come and dig any hole that you want gold. This, this cancerous galamse taking place in Ghana, good source of drinking waters, all polluted and gone. Former Chief Justice. Sophia Akufu also added a voice to the Galamse menace. The Africa we want, however prosperous we envisage it to be, must be sustainable with pristine forests, clean rivers and streams, and clean breathable air, not denuded dust bowls with poisonous water created by Live for Today policies and practices. It's more on this on 3news.com. It's time for business now. And then Kia Mensah Brampan is standing by. I'm with, sitting off it. <laughs> Good evening. sitting by with the business news. I, I hesitated in saying standing by. I know, by. right? I see your yellow t-shirt. Yes. In there. Please, let's stick to business. So, anyway, <laughs> what's, what's happening in business? All right, so we've heard the finance minister speak, uh, telling us about the preparedness of 
government uh, for the second tranche of the IMF program. So we'll be hearing more of that. And the fact that uh, labor expert Austin Gummy is also asking employers to increase basic salaries and rather reduce um, allowances so that it helps rather than calling for more increases in the current SNITS contribution. So we'll hear what exactly he means by what he says. Let's get the details now. As Minister of Finance, Ken Furiata, has expressed optimism about the country meeting all reviews in order to access the second tranche of the IMF program. Ghana is seeking a $3 billion bailout, of which $600,000 has already been accessed as the first tranche. Ken Furiata made this known at the third CEO's breakfast meeting organized by the Ghana Investment Promotion Center here in Accra. We have the first review of the IMF this year and uh, in September the fund will be with us. I'm looking at really the quantitative performance criteria, um, the indicated targets and some of the structural benchmarks. I think we've made a lot of progress in all of that and we expect um, that when the mission comes uh, we'll be able to get a self-level agreement and then be able to go to the board in November. That was Finance Minister Ken Furiata. And Labour expert Austin Gami has rejected calls to increase the current SNIT contributions. Now, this follows proposals from the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, SNIT, and some stakeholders in the pensions industry for the contributions to be increased to make the scheme sustainable. He believes companies should rather focus on increasing basic salaries and reduce allowances of employees, which deprives workers of their pension benefits. The contribution level of uh, working people, as far as uh, is concerned, is enough. It is the mismanagement. It is the mismanagement of it that is should be should be taken a close look at. There is really no need for an upward of the percentage. What should be done is to manage the pension scheme well. The reality is that we have to have a very specific strategic management of the pension scheme and come out with a clear cut return on the investments plan as well and ensure that the plan of investment that have been strategically designed by whoever is in the saddle of SNIT and those fund managers that are managing, managing the, the, the second tier, the various you know, provident funds in the country must we must see the plan. No wait till we are caught up with haircuts and all economic jargons. Tired of it. And that was Labour expert Austin Gamefer and Vice President and Area Director of International Advertising Association Africa has expressed the need to leverage technology to improve and move African brands beyond the continent. Nokodia believes this is key for economic development and she was speaking in Accra at the International Advertising Association's Interactive Regional Conference Africa arising under the theme, Building Future Ready Brands. There's been so much on uh, Modico in terms of pressure from a COVID to economic crisis. And so we need to relook the narrative and address how we progress um, to the future, especially with brands. You know, and brands have been the main blood life of economies and what happens. So we're looking at how we moving our African brands how we're moving them from the local perspective to the continental perspective and then moving them global as well. So it's to gather insights from people who have um, experts who have been in this business and who are ex um, understand the dynamics to share their, um, what you call, their knowledge and experience so it can encourage the entire industry to be uplifted. Vice President and Area Director of International Advertising Association Africa, Noko Dia, there. And just before we go, a potential takeover of the National Investment Bank by ADB is currently 
uh, under consideration. According to sources, government is considering to move as a crucial step in its plans to rescue the struggling financial institution. A banking consultant, Dr. Abaji Debra, says the move of a takeover will save jobs. He is, however, of the view that ADB Bank will need recapitalization to make it viable. The implications of this financial maneuver are profound for both institutions involved and the broader financial ecosystem of Ghana. I'll be bringing you more detail into this ADB NIB takeover in our subsequent bulletins. But when you log on to 3 news we have more business news updates. My name is Nana Ikria Mensa Abrampa. Oreko Ampofo joins us with Sports Aura. Well, thank you very much, Nana Ikria. Let's head straight to Kumase because the Black Stars have arrived in in Kumasi and are currently training at the Babayara Sports Stadium ahead of their final Africa Cup of Nations qualifier against Central African Republic. My colleague Ralph Sarkodier is at the stadium and spoke to some of the fans uh, because what we're hearing is that uh, they're not being allowed into the stadium for the training. Well, so the Black Stars of Ghana are currently here in Kumasi training at the Babayara Stadium with a full house because uh, two players who were missing in camp yesterday, Jordan Ayew, arrived from his base in England. To, uh, today he was in Kumasi and he was able to join the team train. Richard Ofori, also from South Africa, is also in Kumasi here at the Babayara Stadium. So there's a full house for the Black Stars today at the Babayara Stadium. Well, the fans came in their numbers wanted to see the stars train unfortunately they were denied because they well, we are told that the te technical team want to focus on tactical training today and so they want uh, no no further distraction and so the media as well as the supporters who wanted to see the stars train are all behind over here at the Barbara stadium and uh, unable to enter because the, the the facility is heavily guarded by the military and will not allow anybody to enter into the stadium facility and so it looks like everything is set the coach is focused the team is focused and all of them are poised to deliver victory on thursday as they come up against central african republic in the crucial crucial afcon qualifier decider and uh, hopefully the stars will be able to get a victory or perhaps a drawn game to be able to secure qualification to afcon scheduled for cote d'ivoire next year. Yeah, so this is what has ha been happening here at the Babayara Stadium. The fans are very disappointed. Would have loved to see the stars. Unfortunately, they have been denied entry into the facility to watch the stars train. What we are told is that tomorrow they will be given the permission to watch the stars train as they do their final training ahead of that Thursday clash against Central African Republic uh, here at the Babayara Stadium. Reporting for Three Sports, this is Rafael Sarkodie from Kumasi. Well, thank you very much, Rafael. Let's do some more uh, football here in Ghana because Okuhu United have started pre-season. Yeah, I think and uh, they themselves are getting ready for the Division One uh, ahead of that big season for them because they've been absent from the Division One for the past six years. Now, head coach Prince Owusu says that he has the experience to lead a team that has high expectations, such as Okuhu United. Yeah, I think. Uh me personally, it's normal for me. Why do I say that? Because uh, I've been in the business for so long uh, and I know how the uh, traditional clubs are. So we are coping with it. It's not that bad. We are handling it. Well, that was Prince Owusu speaking. Before uh, we wrap it up, uh, Edin Ketia has reviewed he chose England over Ghana because the three lands offered a more natural career progression. The Arsenal striker has received his first senior England call-up ahead of the Euros qualifiers against Ukraine. The call-up was there and the offer was on the table. It was really hard to turn down and something which you know, I felt was obviously the natural progression for myself at this stage and I felt now was a good time to kind of make that step. So... Obviously, I'm really happy to be here and proud to be here, like I said. And hopefully, I can go on and help the team this week and get some caps. And so that's how we wrap up this sports segment. We'll continue to bring you updates on the Black Stars who play on Thursday, so you can follow us on social media at 3 Sports GH. My name is Ray Kwampofo, and up next on the bulletin is Entertainment with Akofa. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Oriku. Now let's begin with our entertainment stories here. Contestants of Ghana's Most Beautiful gave audience an intriguing show with their cultural dance and music on Sunday. From the Gome dance of the Ghans through to the Kuntum dance by the Ahantas and the Asafo dance performed by Fantis, all the ladies brought their A game as they performed indigenous dances peculiar to their regions. Let's check out some highlights. Music and dance are the surest ways of transmitting culture. Ghana's most beautiful contestants on Sunday night turned cultural ambassadors as they display some beautiful Ghanaian rhythms and dance moves. The Greater Accra region was fairly represented. Now, perform the Gome dance, which is usually performed by fishermen after a good catch. Other unique dances, including the Panla dance, the Wongo dance, the Sichi dance, the Front 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 dance, and the Achiabako dance were impressively displayed. At the end of the show, Northern Region's Nura was adjudged a contestant with the best costume, while Buna Region's representative, Kwatama, was adjudged a star performer for the night. Our overall star performer tonight is Kwatama. Kwatama! Congratulations! But the journey of two talented contestants, Western North's Benoa and the Half of Region's Amwini Ma, came to an unfortunate well, end. They did their region so proud. I want you to go out tonight holding your head up, up high. Uh, there's so many girls looking at you. There's so many girls being inspired by you. Go back home and keep your light shining. You did well. Well, away from that, let's do some more stories now. The Hood Talk Music Festival assembled some of the best music talents and goodwill ambassadors at its first major concert in Accra. Artists took to the stage not just to entertain thousands of fans, but to add their voices and artistry to call on leaders, international organizations and individuals to help protect and care for children in society. Using the power of music as a tool for positive societal change, the Hood Talk Music Festival, which is an innovation of the Dream Child Foundation, assembled some of the best musicians and goodwill ambassadors at its first major concert in Accra. <laughs> Artists took to the stage not just to entertain thousands of fans, but to add their voices and artistry to the call on leaders, international organizations, and individuals to help protect and care for children in society. We really appreciate this fusion, the purpose, but the, the music we are doing is to make sure that it, it applies to the lives of people, it applies to society, you know, and this is more like a connection, you know, getting the music to the people in a way, in a way of creating awareness for all of this good stuff around. So thank all the big people behind this agenda. We thank TV3. We thank everybody for making this happen. It's From September 9 to December 9, 2023, the Hot Talk Music Festival, characterized by several activities and events, aims to construct five pediatric clinics for the Ghanaian children in several communities. And the music festival will make Tamale its next big stop. And that'll be all the entertainment news here on Hot Edition. Alfred? Well, we have just some breaking news just coming through minutes ago. Alan Kojucha Manting, the flag bearer hopeful of the MPP, has issued a statement announcing his decision to withdraw from the flag bearer race. That is the breaking news just coming through. We have a press statement to that effect by Alan Chomanting. It reads, I quote, on Sunday, the 27th of August, 2023, I issued a public statement which made reference to the selection and shortlisting of presidential aspirants by the Special Electoral College convened by the new Petote Party on 26th of August, 2023. After having carefully analyzed the results of the said election, it is absolutely clear to me from events leading to, during and after the elections that the Special Delegates Conference was strategically and tactically skewed in favor of one particular aspirant. The pronouncement made by some leading members of our party both before and after the elections also lend weight to my observations. The level of intimidation of varying intensity directly and indirectly unleashed on a significant number of delegates at various voting centers across the 16 regions is unprecedented in the history of our party 
In addition, the fact that mine polling agent in the northeast region has suffered severe damage to his eyesight arising from his bold and courageous effort to ensure compliance with the very rules and regulations for the conduct of the elections as approved by the presidential elections committee will forever remain a dark spot in the history of the internal elections of the npp this incident and the various acts of violence and collusion reported in other voting centers are appalling unconstitutional unconscionable and despicable I am committed to and value the safety of those who work with me and for me. And I will always fight for the interest of the people. The question I keep asking myself is, how did we get here as a party, NPP, in the first place? And how far are we prepared to tread on this dangerous path to self-destruction? Regrettably, I am not convinced that the circumstances I have referred to earlier will not persist or even be escalated in the next round of elections for which balloting is scheduled for wednesday 6th of september 2023 in the light of the foregoing i wish to confirm that i am honorably withdrawing from the process that will lead to the presidential primaries to be held on the 4th of november 2023 in the next upcoming weeks i will provide an update an indication of the role that i will play in politics in ghana after consultation with my family and other well wishes, various stakeholders and interest groups. I wish all the other aspirants well as they continue on their journey. I also wish to use this opportunity to express my profound gratitude once again to my family, the Alan for President campaign team, and all my teaming supporters in Ghana and from around the world who have supported me in diverse ways over the years. Please be assured that the battle is still the Lord's and that those who wait upon the Lord shall have their strength renewed. God bless our homeland Ghana and make our nation great and strong. Signed, Alan Kojo Chamanting. So this is the breaking news just coming through. Alan Chamanting has withdrawn from the MPP flag bearer race and the details spans from the areas of issues he had with the electoral college itself for this special delegates congress that took place two weeks ago plus the intimidation and the violence that his agents had to suffer on that said day for the special delegates conference and all those he says has led to the decision to have him withdraw from the flag bearer race there's more on 3news.com Make some time and visit 3news.com. On behalf of the team, thank you for staying with us here on Hot Edition. I am Alfred Akonse. Have a great, great evening. And join me at 10 p.m. for Ghana Tonight for more on this. Plus, the Cecilia Dapa happenings. Stay with us.